Good morning. Let me extend my gratitude for each of you taking this time today to dedicate to the vitality of your faith life. I give thanks for each of you who have put faith in this community of believers to carry you more deeply into your relationship with Jesus. I am grateful that the activity of worshiping God won the battle of the calendar for you today. And I am especially thankful that we are able to worship together in so many ways here in the sanctuary and at home, maybe this morning or maybe some other day this week. Thank you. Thank you for journeying with us on this path of discipleship. So let's begin by taking a deep breath and giving thanks to God. Thanks for allowing us to live this day. Thanks for the breath that fills our lungs. Thanks for the heart that beats in our chests. Thanks for allowing us to be alive in a world that beams with new hope and with joy. Today we continue our series on joy. We've touched on a number of heart and head attributes of Jesus that contribute to living a life full of joy. We've talked about perspective and humility, generosity and forgiveness, compassion and acceptance. Today we'll be talking about how embracing a mindset of gratitude creates a fertile heart of joy. So let's see what the Colossian church was taught about what life looks like as fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. This is from Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, as God's choice, holy and loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with each other. And if someone has a complaint against anyone, Forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so also forgive each other. And over all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The peace of Christ must control your hearts, a peace into which you were called in one body, and be thankful people. The word of Christ must live in you richly. Teach and warn each other with all wisdom by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Whatever you do, whether in speech or action, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus and give thanks to God the Father through him. Now Plymouth First may look nothing like that Colossian church. Our gatherings may be unrecognizable as faith gatherings to those first century folks. But it looks like the, first, the Colossian church and the Plymouth church have some things in common. We've been made right by the grace of God. They were made right by the grace of God. We are endeavoring to live lives of compassion, humility, forgiveness, and gratitude. They did too. We sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs out of the wisdom we gain from these new lives as holy and beloved people of God. And the Church of Colossae did the same. That's the testament of a life fully devoted to Christ. So when was the last time you were so grateful you couldn't help but sing? When was the last time you sang, not because it was what was expected, but because God had done the unexpected? Mine was this morning, just a few minutes ago, not too long before I got up here. When I come to worship, I am so deeply moved by the grace of God in my life. And so deeply reminded that it is an unearned gift better than winning the lotto. And I am so deeply grateful that I can't help but sing. Off key, out of rhythm, but I sing because my heart sings in the peace, love, and joy of Christ. My three-year-old granddaughter. 
has recently taken up singing. She's learned several kids' songs, Frere Jaca, Do You Know the Muffin Man, and The Lion Sleeps Tonight, among others. Recently, she has started ad-libbing the lyrics. For example, she sings, Kiwi Fields Forever, instead to the tune of Strawberry Fields Forever, and then she cracks up. She was visiting last weekend, and while playing with her fire engine in the front yard, she was singing at the top of her lungs. I love Granny's, Granny's house. I love going to Granny's house. Let me tell you right now, I was so delighted. It was so good to know that she was so grateful to be with me that it drove her to break out in joyful song. What a gift that was. Hearing my granddaughter's song belted out from my front lawn, you might think that my house is some fantastic amusement park. But it's not. Indeed, their house is bigger and fancier. Their park has more slides, which are the only important part to my granddaughter. She has more friends and more toys at her house than she does at ours. But she loves coming to Granny's house because she just loves being in the company of me and her pop-pop. People who unconditionally love her. People who have some new gift every time she shows up, who are always willing to listen to her rambling three-year-old versions of stories. We love her with the reckless abandon of doting grandparents. Wouldn't you love to possess the passionate gratitude of a three-year-old at her grandparents' house? It would be great to be able to grab on to that level of thankfulness every day. But kids' lives are easy, right? They don't have the worries and the concerns of adults. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? We spend the first 18 or so years of our lives wanting to be grown-ups. I want to be in control of our own lives. We want to make all our own decisions. And then we spend the rest of our lives worrying. Why? Because we're the ones in control of our own lives. Because we're the ones making our own decisions. I know that I certainly did not expect being a grown-up to be this hard. I thought it would be a lot more carefree. And I definitely thought I would be wiser and I have a lot more answers by this age. It's strange that although we have more control and power over our lives, it's actually more difficult to be grateful. I love how a three-year-old handed an ice cream sandwich on a sunny day will respond with gratitude and joy. But I can eat whatever I want, whenever I want, and I, I bemoan having to decide what's for dinner every night. I love how a three-year-old getting a new $2 bottle of bubbles will play for hours. But I have thousands of dollars worth of entertainment devices and still find myself shopping for something new. I love how a three-year-old walks down the sidewalk and examines every leaf and caterpillar worm and bird along the way. But I head out with my, mic my headphones on and I climb into my own head and I never really see what God puts in my path. The truth is, I'm kind of ungrateful. How about you? There's a story told about Matthew Henry. He was a man who wrote a six-volume commentary on the Bible. Needless to say, he was someone who took his faith very seriously. 
the story goes, that a man once stole his wallet. In reflecting on the incident, Henry said that this incident had given him an opportunity to be thankful. He went on to say that he was thankful for four things. One, I am thankful that he never robbed me before. Two, I am thankful that although he took my wallet, he did not take my life. Three, I am thankful though he took all that I had, it wasn't very much. And four, I am glad that it was I who was robbed and not I who did the robbing. Matthew Henry knew how to be grateful despite his circumstances and his experiences. He did not assume that bad things should not happen to him. He did not put more value on possessions than on life. He was able to keep his losses in perspective, and he knew that his own integrity and his own value was not marred by the incident. Henry maintained an attitude of gratitude because he strongly believed that ingratitude toward God is the first step toward disengaging from God. We see this in Romans, it's chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. The Apostle Paul describes this path that people take in separating themselves from God. The first step is an attitude of ingratitude. Paul says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. He goes on to say, Their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, when we take God's blessings for granted, we miss out on the joy it is to live in the kingdom of God. We become self-centered and lose the desire to even spend time with God in prayer or song. So are we ungrateful even though life in the kingdom of God is at least as good? as a weekend visit to Granny and Pop Pops. Truly, God is good. We are all and each created in the image of God and deeply, unconditionally loved by God. We are freely and generously blessed with gifts that range from monumental like our salvation to mundane like the rising sun. And God pays full attention to the songs of our hearts. Be they prayer, poem, or music. Be they lament, petition, praise, or thanksgiving. We have the attention of God every time we seek it. Maybe one of the side effects of having God so gracious and generous with us all the time is that we take it all for granted. Maybe it's just a product of our sin natures. When something is too readily available, we devalue it. The life-giving elements of sun and air and water, the promise of spring, the delights of relationship, the gift of life, and life eternal. God has given them all to us so freely, and some days we hardly even notice, much less embrace with gratitude. So this week I want to challenge you. Okay, well, I want to challenge me too. I want to challenge all of us to not take for granted the gift of living in the kingdom of God. I want to challenge us to be filled with gratitude so abundant that joy is the only possible outcome. And I found a few suggestions for little things we can do to increase our gratitude, to make us folks who think like Matthew Henry or a singing three-year-old. There's a practice called the Daily Examine, 
It's a technique of prayerful reflection on the events of the day in order to detect God's presence and discern God's direction for us. It's an ancient Christian practice that's credited to St. Ignatius. It can help us see God's hand at work. So here's a contemporary kind of version of it. The end of your day, take time to, one, become aware of God's presence. Name where you saw God that day and acknowledge God's presence in the moment. Two, review the day with gratitude. I am thankful that my eyes open, my heart beats, my body rose from the bed. I am thankful for hot water, for showers, for food to eat. You get the idea, right? Three, pay attention to your emotions. When did you experience anger? When did you experience joy? When did you laugh and when did you cry? Four, choose one feature of the day and pray from it. Name one moment in the day that you want God to redeem or that you particularly want to thank God for. And, and then pray with the emotions of that moment. Five, look for ways to be more aware of God's presence tomorrow. Commit to pausing more before you act or commit to time away from the busyness of the day. Commit to a little time in nature or whatever works for you to bring you a deeper awareness of God's presence. If you're looking for something a little simpler, you can ask yourself three questions each day. What have I received from God? What have I given to God? And what troubles and difficulties have I caused? Or maybe this is more like something you'd like to do. Leave yourself notes of gratitude around the house and beyond. On your bathroom mirror, write a note that says, thank you, God, for the gift of this body that has carried me through life. On your refrigerator, thank you, God, for the gift of food. On your front door, thank you, God, for the rising sun and all of your creation. And on your desk at work, thank you, God, for the ability to work. And you can put notes any other place with whatever words you want that will help you pause for a moment and remember that you are blessed beyond measure with the privilege of life in the kingdom of God. When we take our attention off of our disappointments or failures or struggles, when we focus on that reckless love of God, the generosity with which God operates in the world and the amazing ways that God avails God's self to hear our prayers, our poems, and our songs. Who knows? Maybe after a week of practicing gratitude, we'll all come back here and be singing with this reckless joy of a three-year-old. I love being with God. Who knows? <laughs>